Hello people, now once again from the Overtracker magazine. Well, it's finally here. Intel Z890 chipset and matching Core Ultra 200 CPUs. Lots to talk about, lots to get excited about, but also plenty that needs to be answered regarding the platform as a whole. Without further delay, let's get right into it. As usual, the ROG Maximus Z890 Apex represents the pinnacle of overclocking and enthusiast motherboards from the ROG team. Over and above all the features and capabilities we've seen from the previous chipset models, the Z890 Apex introduces a number of firsts and today stands as the most complete Apex board to ever exist. But before any of that, what kind of price are we looking at here? Well, I can't tell you exactly, but it should be around 15,800 at Woodware or 720 US dollars on Amazon. So it's where it always was in terms of affordability. It's a premium motherboard built for an uncompromised user experience. So what does that mean exactly? Well, it's over-engineered as usual, or at least where power delivery is concerned. It features, a, listen to this, 22 plus one plus two plus two power stage solution with 2210M power stages for the CPU cores alone. I think we can all agree that that's more than enough power to power any CPU that would ever find itself on this platform or pretty much any other consumer desktop platform for that matter. ASUS doesn't state explicitly, but I suspect this is an eight layer or perhaps even a 10 layer PCB that's finished in white. A throwback to the original Z790 Apex, which I found visually appealing or rather more so than the follow up, the Encore, which replaced it. Actually, talking about visuals, while the PCB is off-white, the general motherboard color is actually silver or cobble gray. I know some may have preferred an actual white motherboard, but I think it actually works as is, especially with the matching AIO and some DRAM for instance. What isn't white are the various headers, including the ATX power connector, DRAM slots, and so forth. So since I mentioned DRAM slots, one of the major selling points for this board is DRAM OC and the performance capabilities. Yes, it's a two dim board with a daisy chain trace layout. However, the secret source for ROG is in the Nitro Pass DRAM slots. It's likely a little bit more complicated and more technical than what I'm able to explain to you. But essentially, DRAM slots are not ideally terminated or rather are susceptible to reflections at the end of transmission lines. This can cause all sorts of issues, including but not limited to standing waves and all forms of signal distortions that do compromise the DRAM frequency. NitroPass has the DRAM lines terminate at the end where they make contact with the gold pads or fingers on the actual DRAM sticks. ASUS is claiming that this can increase DRAM frequency by up to 200 MHz or 400 megatransactions per second. That is to say, on a board that would otherwise stop at, say, DDR5-8000, you can actually do DDR5-8400 via NitroPass DRAM slot. This brings me to a related DRAM feature as well called DimFit. This one pretty much does mem tuning for you to some degree so that you don't have to spend the hours trying to find the best timings for your memory. On the Apex specifically, it can take anywhere between four and five hours for the board to deliver the best timings that are not only performant but reliable as well. So for instance, if you have DDR5-8000 in your system, using DimFit can help you set 8200 reliably, taking the guesswork out of the DRAM tuning and saving you time as well. I will personally be using this feature for DRAM reviews going forward where possible. We will return to memory at a later point though, however, because there's actually the quality of life features that I wanna get through. And those are the things that I think the ROG team has added to the Apex board, which makes it usable in a 24 seven environment, or at least more so than it's ever been before. A standout for me, which is part and parcel of the new Z890 chipset is the vastly improved connectivity options. In fact, I'd say the Apex lacks nothing that a high-end gaming board should have. Maybe the audio portion isn't up to the hero or the extreme standards, but it's more than good enough. I mean, it's built around the ALC4080 codec, a Cybertech op M, and has Dolby Atmos license, and that's been a working solution on many boards until now. Where the Apex really stands out, outside the context of overclocking of course, isn't the total number of M.2 drives supported. It's six in total, two on the DIM.2 module of course, and four on the board itself. The primary M.2 socket has a beast of a heatsink. It's definitely superior to the brick that I saw on the most recent ROG board review that I did. This M.2 socket, however, and heatsink have such an elaborate installation mechanism that probably contributed too much to this board's pricing, I think. It's a tool-free design, which is very nice, but it is a very sophisticated mechanism for what ROG already had in a more simplified manner previously. However, let's talk about the Ray I.O. On the Ray I.O., you'll find from left to right, clear CMOS and BIOS flash buttons, a PS2 keyboard and mouse combo port, 
four five gigabit USB ports, four 10 gigabit USB ports, two Thunderbolt ports, and an additional 20 gigabit per second type C port. To us regular folk, it translates into just three type C USB ports. You have a Realtek 5G Ethernet port and Wi Fi 7 connectivity. For the overclockers, is what we've come to expect from an Apex board, which is base clock buttons for both the CPU and SOC independently, BIOS switch for the two BIOS versions you can have, a post code display, safe boot, the retry button, RSVD switch for LN2 temperatures, slow mode, LN2 mode, and the probic section, which allows monitoring of various voltages in real time. But more importantly, the quality of life improvements here are that there are two Type C USB headers as well. One 10 gigabit and the other one is a 20 gigabit per second port. There's an additional 8 pin PCIe connector here as well. Not sure what this could be for. It could be for extreme overclocking of VGA cards or providing additional power to the front USB Type C for Quick Charge 4 or for both functionalities. The board has a total of nine four pin fan headers. Two are full speed fan headers and the rest are programmable, of course. I didn't expect this, but the secondary full length PCIe slot is electrically wired to eight lanes. So technically, you could use it for a GPU as well, but obviously it'll shut off two M.2 sockets, but I can imagine the remaining four are enough for most people. But with all that out the way, let's move on to the BIOS and there are a few changes here that I think are worth speaking about. Most obvious is the HD interface, which is at least new to me. It is much appreciated and just easier on the eyes. Functionality, however, is pretty much the same as it was in the legacy interface. At the time of writing, the BIOS featured a few number of DRAM profiles, from 8200 up to 8600 and 147600 I think as well. The QVL states that the board supports up to DDR5 9600 via CU DIMMs, but we will have to see. That being said, let's move on to the benchmarks. Power is provided by the XPG Fusion 1600W ATX 3.0 PSU. Kingston Memory provided the CU DIMMs for this testing, but I instead used the exceptional Fury Limited Edition set instead, which was more than comfortable at DDR5 8600 speeds at just 1.454. Now I won't be going through all the benchmarks here. Reason being, I have a separate video on the Intel Core Ultra 9285K, where I'll have over 20 graphs and analysis to share with you guys. That performance testing was done on the Apex as well, but it's more reflective of the CPU rather than the board, so I don't want to conflate these two things. Anyway, first up is Ida64 memory bandwidth. Not much here other than that it matches the previous 14th gen CPUs at the standard settings, around 90 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. With overclocking to DDR5 8600, that can be as high as 130 gigabytes per second. Latency, well, we start off at 81 nanoseconds and go down to 68 nanoseconds with overclocking to 8600 CL38. A 16% improvement. Mind you, this is a profile that exists on the Apex board that you can just simply load for massive performance gains. We then move on to Cinebench 2024. Here again, we can see improvements from mostly DRAM frequency and voltage optimizations that allow the CPU to reach its advertised frequencies. This is impressive performance that is made even more so by the fact that there's only 24 cores this time and it's beating AMD's 32 core monster, the 7950X, by some margin. In 3 Mark CPU profile test and CPU mark, the Z890 Apex and the Core Ultra 285K combination is very good, once again outpacing the Ryzen 9 7950X despite the threat deficit. The new e cores are powerful alright, exceptionally so. We finally then turn to the only gaming benchmark I'll show you this time, and which is the Hitman World of Assassination. Here from the defaults to OC, there's about 7% gain in performance, especially in the 1% lows. So overclocking does actually yield some meaningful performance differences. And the last bit of performance I'll show you is the package temperature. You'll notice that the overclock settings are consistently running cooler. The reason for this is quite simple. Voltage frequency offsets, primarily on the peak course. Obviously, this has to be balanced with load line calibration and so forth. But true to the power consumption figures, you can consume less power, produce less heat and still get better performance via such tuning. Well, there you have it, guys. The ROG Maximus Z890 Apex, without a doubt, the most complete version of the Apex that's actually ever existed. This time, I think it's safe to say it's built for overclocking, but is right at home in any high-end gaming builds that you can think of. To be honest with you, as a motherboard that represents the platform right now on day one, 
I can't find fault with it at all. Like no fault at all. However, I can imagine things will improve and there will be obviously some technical issues in terms of the barriers, uh, compatibility, overclocking and so forth that will be improved upon in future. But right now, this is an immaculate motherboard. Once again, the ROG team has produced a spectacular board that is most definitely in the competition for the best money can buy. Until the next video then, when we talk about the 200 series specifically, share, like, and subscribe. Take great care of yourselves, guys. Peace, and I'll see you on the flip side.